Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, we start with uh, this webinar um, on uh, on uh, a bladder pain syndrome in tussitious cystitis, uh, um, dealing with uh, the problem of uh, of uh, epidemiological uh, conflicts that uh, is one of the major problem dealing with uh, this uh, this syndrome. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the ERN for uh, the support for uh, those uh, uh, webinars, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, Michel Batier for uh, for the some words of introduction to everybody. Please, uh, Michel. Yes, hello, good evening, Mauro, um, and welcome everybody uh, to one of the Eurogen uh, webinar series. And I'm delighted to say that we have a special mini series of webinars that we're producing in um, collaboration with ISIC, which is the International Society for the Study of Bladder Pain Syndrome. So I'd just like to take a couple of minutes at the beginning just to mention what a European reference network is and does. Well, Eurogen is one of 24 European reference networks created and funded by the European Commission, and they were set up in 2017. They cover most medical fields and all deal with patients with rare diseases. And in Eurogen, we cover patients with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions, and they all need highly specialised surgery. And we're a network now of 57 uh, healthcare providers in 20 member states. And the aim is really about collaboration. It's to pull together that highly specialised knowledge so that we can deliver quicker specialist evaluation and more equitable access to high quality diagnosis, treatment and care for patients with these rare and complex conditions. So as you saw from the first slide, uh, one of our services is we offer virtual consultations using a secure platform across borders. So teams of our experts can come together in an MDT and provide any healthcare professional in the uh, European Union with advice if you have a really complex or rare case. Um, we also have a registry under development we all know that data on these patients is fragmented and scattered all over Europe. So the idea is to collect all this evidence that's much needed um, so that we can do far more interesting research in the future into uh, patients with rare diseases. We are also working on clinical guidelines together and education and training activities. So without further ado, I'll give uh, Mauro Cervicini, um, who is of course the president, of ISIC and he's professor of urogynecology at La Spansia University in Polo Pontino. Um, Mauro, thank you so much uh, for being here with us this evening. It's a great honour and uh, please uh, um, we thank you very much for sharing this and for introducing the rest of the presenters. Thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you Michelle for uh, this uh, introduction and uh, this is a uh, uh, first one of the, uh, as I told you in the, in the in the introduction, this is one of the the the, the first uh, webinar on the interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome uh, uh, for uh, um, dealing about the epidemiological conflicts uh, on uh, this uh, specific uh, uh, aspect of uh, uh, urogenital and uh, rare disease. Um, uh, with me uh, uh, this evening, uh, there are uh, three uh, outstanding speakers. One is uh, Jean-Jacques Windele, the other one is uh, Robert Moldwin, and the third one is An Chong Kuo. Uh, Windele is uh, it's a colleague from Europe, from Belgium, uh, Robert Moldwin from the USA, and uh, An Chong Kuo, and uh, three of them, they will speak about the, the, the epidemiological data from uh, Europe, from the US, and uh, from uh, Asia, Korea, um, Taiwan, and Japan. Um, this is my disclosure. I have no disclosure. Uh, as uh, uh, Michelle said, uh, uh, the, the European Reference work, uh, Network is, uh, is working for patients with rare 
and complex disease, uh, and uh, the uh, urogenital disease uh, represent one of the 24 uh, ER and uh, uh, networks. Um, the structure uh, consists of, uh, of the chair uh, coordinated by uh, Vout Fitz, and there is an advisor board by international experts and the supporting partner, including uh, ESTIC, the Euro European International Society for the Study of Interstitial Cystitis. And if you see, uh, the, the, the interstitial cystitis is included in the work stream two in the e eurogen with the in uh, uh, in the in the uh, order of functional eurogenital condition uh, requiring highly specialized surgery defining the the uh, bladder pain syndrome interstitial cystitis uh, uh, is like a hole in the air as uh, said the target ald and uh, that's the reason why uh, in 2003 in Europe has been found that the International Society specifically uh, studying the, the, the uh, ICBPS and uh, 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 that is considered like a puzzle or a maze for physician and, and patients. Where we started from? Uh, these are uh, this is uh, uh, one of the, uh, the 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 paper we publish in the European Urology for diagnostic criteria classification and nomenclature for at that time uh, considered the painful bladder syndrome interstitial cystitis but as it proposed uh, to change the name from painful bladder syndrome to bladder pain syndrome that has been accepted uh, nowadays worldwide the definition is a pain related to the urinary bladder accompanied by at least one other urinary symptom such as daytime and nighttime frequency exclusion of computable diseases as the cause of symptom and mainly cystoscopy with hydrodistension. Uh, looking at the epidemiology, the result um, vary widely depending upon definition and methodology. One of the major reasons for such discrepancy is the lack of uniform definition of IC. This is, uh, these are the, the Asian guidelines in which they define the frequency urgency syndrome, the FUS, and specifically the hypersensitive bladder syndrome in which there is uh, the uh, FUS in, in the uh, uh, urgency is persistent and due to fear of pain, and is uh, one um, difference um, um, compared to the uh, classical definition of BPSIC. And then define in a, a big umbrella, you can see in which uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, frequency urgency syndromes, and there, are, there is a small subset of uh, hypersensitive bladder um, um, sensitivity uh, syndrome, and specifically, the interstitial cystitis is represented as a, a smaller group of patients. This uh, has been uh, um, proposed by the Yukio Oma, a urologist from Japan, as well as from Tomohiro Wida. We, we, try, we, we make a, a, a world conference just to, to, to uh, 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 see if there was a possibility for a consensus meeting on uh, on this definition uh, in 2000 uh, um, in, in 12 in, it is in 2012 in uh, in Rome um, and uh, in which there was uh, the Asian delegates you can see the Yukio Yukio Oma and Tomohiro Wida and uh, the North American delegates with uh, Rob Maldwin and uh, the European with uh, jean jack Windel and myself. Uh, there are some limitations of approach. One is the prevalence estimating estimates of uh, ICBPS BPS that vary considerably because of differences in source population. Uh, this is a, 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 a RAND study proposed by in US, but you can see that has been assessed through a contact by telephone that is completely different 
compared to the, the, the o and, and, and traditional ASIC uh, criteria. And the, the, another uh, database uh, interstitial cystitis study revealed a greater heterogeneity in patient characteristic than previously thought. So this is, uh, you can see the prevalence on female population, population there is a, a huge, a broad uh, discrepancy among different countries. This is uh, absolutely uh, impossible to draw any conclusion. Uh, in 2003, uh, there was a, 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 a consensus conference on IC in Kyoto, in Japan, with the definition criteria of IC. And there was a, 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 a difference, a, a dramatic difference in perspective from US and Europe. You can see in, U, in US, the diagnostic tool is at that time urine marker and symptom score, while in Europe, we we thought that was absolutely mandatory to make to make a cystoscopy with hydro distension to make a diagnosis, and this is one of the major difference, and can 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 explain so much discrepancy on terms of, of epidemiology. And this is the score proposed by the ESIC with the with the, with the biopsy and cystoscopy with a uh, uh, different score parameter from, uh, from uh, double X to one, to two, to three, including normal uh, um, evaluation of the, of, the, of the blood mucosa with the glomerulation and, and the, the, the anal lesion um, presence or absence. The glomerulation uh, most recently has been not considered a, a diagnostic specific criteria. So we need to be careful how you survey matters and what you ask matters because most, most pelvic pain is not PPS. And you can see uh, if you look at the symptom surveys and the patient self reported and the physician diagnosis, there is a, a, a huge discrepancy. This is one of the explanation why there is a conflict of data on the epidemiology. So. Uh, for for us in Europe is not considered a common disease, but is a, is a, is a rare disease. It's not a question, and because uh, in Europe has considered rare disease uh, five cases over ten thousand um, patient uh, population people, and while in US is seven point five, and in Japan four on uh, on uh, ten thousand has been considered also in the orphan, orphan drug uh, uh, action. Uh, in Italy, we have a national registry, and we have 3.7 patients, um, uh, over 10,000 um, um, population people. This is uh, the, 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 the reason why has been considered in Europe, uh, uh, specifically a rare disease. Uh, this is one uh, interesting paper in which uh, they describe uh, the, the difference. The AUA guidelines do not indicate cystoscopy as an integral part of the initial diagnostic evaluation for ICBPS, while uh, the ESIC and the Asian guidelines recommend cystoscopy with either extension and biopsy as diagnostic prerequisite for, for uh, evaluation. So the, uh, looking at uh, the epidemiology, it's important how patients are identifying. Then the phenotyping is uh, absolutely at the moment mandatory. What the U point is one of the possible phenotyping uh, patient evaluation. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, we need to identify one or more biomarkers the defini defining phenotyping, developing epidemiological screening tools, and uh, uh, establish international patient database uh, probably supported by DS. This is uh, one of the introduction of the problem. Now we'll, we'll move uh, to see and to look uh, uh, what's happened in Europe, what uh, in uh, in uh, in Asia, and finally with uh, with the, the, the situation in uh, uh, in US.
please darren uh, send the, the the video of of uh, Jinjek Windel. hello everybody um i am Jacques Quindale from belgium i was the previous president of essex and its actual treasurer i was asked to talk about the epidemiological uh, data of BPSIC, but in relation to the European situation. And I expanded a little bit to find uh, a proper answer myself by asking myself, is the prevalence of BPSIC actually known? Do we have reliable epidemiological data? one would have the tendency to say no we don't have it because there is the inconsistency of diagnostic criteria used in different studies there is the rarity of the disease prevalence is the main topic in majority one center reports or local area reports are diagnosed by different types of care providers and they can look at the problem in a different way. Population-based studies are more representative, but population-based studies are few. Several studies use questionnaires to detect the prevalence of the of the dysfunction and the, the, the problem but they have shortcomings to my knowledge the first time I'm aware of of this uh, epidemiological study was from 1975 and based on the number of patients treated in the intake area of the Helsinki University Hospital Numeric data were given like 18.1 for females, 10.6 per 100,000 for both genders. Other studies like the Netherlands gave 8 to 16 on 100,000, which is not so different from what Helsinki had found. Population-based studies. In Finland, for instance, 1,343 women were investigated with a questionnaire and six mm, corresponding to 0.45% would seem to have criteria for probable IC. If there was a clinical examination done in the same group in moderate or severe symptoms, 2.3% um, counted uh, on 100,000 is clinically probably confirmed and 5.3% um, possibly probably are confirmed. Other data are from studies in Austria, where you find 0.36%. And this corresponds with data that you will hear in the, in the following presentations, like for instance, Japan, Korea, where they have 0.26%. What are now points of discussion? Everything started with the NIDDK had a lot of limitations. Pain was not considered mandatory. The age had to be above 18. And the voiding had to be less than 350. That excluded really a lot of, of uh, possible patients. And it was not um, really a good way of continuing. Pain is not present in everyone. It can also be described as discomfort. And then, of course, there is the problem of distinction with overactive bladder. Overactive bladder 
can feel uncomfortable can also get uh, frequency and urgency, but it is definitely not BPSIC. The ESIC um, in uh, publication European Urology in 2008 described the BPSIC as a chronic, and I've put here six months or more, but uh, not everyone agrees that it should be as long this period, a chronic pelvic pain, pressure or discomfort perceived in relation to the urinary bladder and accompanied by at least one other urinary symptom such as persistent urge to void or frequency. This definition seems to work well. More arguments that it is a BPSIC are gained from excluding confusable diseases, again, well described by our ESSEC in previous publications. And then you come in the, with the first group where you would consider they have BPSIC, then it becomes clear that phenotyping is necessary because you have a HANA lesion, you have non-HANA lesion, and recent publications have shown that there is quite a difference between the groups. Um, other types of phenotyping will have to be done uh, because uh, we'll have to be developed further. And if you want such a distinction, then it becomes clear that cystoscopy with or without hydrodistension is just necessary. How can you know if there is a HANA lesion if you cannot diagnose it? Okay, my conclusion so far and the end of this uh, European guided uh, presentation is a majority suspected diagnosis from symptoms. That's what mostly is done, okay? One says, okay, there are these symptoms, and so we suspect that it might be a case of BPSIC. There are um, aims at improving the diagnosis with specific diagnostic testing, and it needs to be studied better. The prevalence figures today make BPSIC a rare disease. But prevalence figures, as I just presented to you, have limitations. And it is mandatory that if you present prevalence figures, that you also have to present well described the methodology which was used. Thank you. To An Chong Kuo presentation. Thanks, thanks, Narek. My talk today in this webinar series is the epidemiology of interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome in Asian countries. I have no conflict of interest. In 1915, Dr. Hana reported a peculiar form of bladder ulceration, which is later called interstitial cystitis. In 1978, Dr. Mason and Stemi found some women with IC did not have harness lesion, but showed characteristic glomeration hemorrhage after cystoscopic hydrodistension. They call it early IC. The terminology of ICVPS has been debated for several decades. In the Asian guidelines of ICVPS, we have concluded that ICVPS should be considered as an umbrella term which includes IC, BPS, and IC-like symptoms. Interstitial cystitis is specifically defined if there are characteristic harness lesions appeared in cystoscopy or after hydrodistension. If there are glomerations without harness lesion, bladder pain syndrome should be considered. The prevalence rate of ICBPS varied widely, depending on the definition of ICBPS based on symptom questionnaire alone, cystoscopic hydrodistension finding, or after bladder biopsy. 
the reported prevalence of ICBPS range from 0.01% to 2.3%. In USA, about 0.87% in general population, including 1.08% in women and 0.66% in men. In Japan, 1% of general population experienced pain in Korea, IC was diagnosed in 0.261% of women, and in Taiwan, a 0.042% prevalence rate was reported in 2013. The female to male ratio of ICBPS is about 5 to 1. In the definition of ICBPS, the ASIC, East Asia, and AUA guidelines had different criteria. In ASIC and AUA, definition of ICBPS is based on symptoms including pain and greater irritative symptoms. But Asian guidelines stick on cystoscopic findings of harness lesion or mucosa breathing after distension. There are several steps in establishing a clinical diagnosis of ICBPS, including symptoms, small bladder capacity, cystoscopic finding, and bladder biopsy. Based on the cystoscopic findings, the phenotype of ICBPS includes no glomeration, characteristic glomeration, and with harness lesion. However, harness lesion diseases also differs in the diagnosis treatment and outcome from Brady pain syndrome. Therefore, IC should be referred to those with harness lesion and BPS for those without harness lesion in cystoscopic examination. In histopathological findings, no other IC or harness IC had different severity of inflammation of the Brady wall. The immunohistochemistry staining of your thesis Cytoskeletal proteins also show that decreased urethelial cytoskeletal and cell proliferation protein expressions in ICBPS. Patients with harness lesion and grade 3 glomerulations. Recent research has also revealed that IEB virus infection could be an etiology for IC, especially the harness IC which can be controlled by antiviral medication. Regarding the prevalence of harness IC, the prevalence rate of harness IC depends on the cystoscopic diagnosis of harness lesion, range from 5 to 57% of the overall IC BPS patients. In our single center data, harness IC was found only in 7.8% of 309 patients. There is a third clinical phenotype of ICBPS, that is patients who have IC-like symptoms but not proven having greater lesions during cystoscopy. Patients with IC-like symptoms might have etiologies outside the urinal bladder, such as anxiety, depression, irritable bowel, migraine, and other medical comorbidities. Using presenting symptoms, it is difficult to differentiate ICBPS, hypersensitive bladder, or urodynamically normal patients. In a previous study, Clemens have shown that the prevalence of ICBPS is highly variable due to different definition criteria. The true prevalence of IC might be lower than currently report in US and EU epidemiology studies based on symptoms alone. Nevertheless, the ratio of female to male ICBPS patients remains about 5 or 6 to 1. Most of the presenting symptoms are frequency and pain over the bladder area. ICBPS is also associated with many functional somatic syndromes. These overlapping relationships of functional somatic syndromes constitute the central sensitization syndrome. The prevalence of ICBPS based on the questionnaires also differs between 
O'Leary stent symptom score and the pelvic pain and urgency frequency symptom scales. Recently, we found that a focal or diffused thickening of the bladder wall in patients with harness IC. The thickening of the bladder wall can be clearly found in the bladder CT scan. The bladder wall thickening is also associated with high grade of glomerulations after hydrodistension and the presence of harness lesion. The bladder wall thickening is commonly seen in ASIC type 3 and IC patients with small maximum bladder capacity. The histopathological study also revealed that the thicker bladder wall contains dense collagen fiber accumulation in superficial and deep lamina propria. Using electron microscope, I see patients had defective urothelial umbrella cell and cell tight junctions. The uroplakin protein also shows defective in the umbrella cell membrane, resulting in a loss of precur and the vesicles of the cell membrane, which restricts the distension of cell membrane during bladder distension. In addition, urine inflammatory cytokines and oxidative stress biomarkers also showed increases in IC patients with small maximum bladder capacity, suggesting different severity of inflammation among different subtypes of non harness IC. While in patients with harness IC, urine biomarkers such as MCP1, L-toxin, M1P, 1-beta, Rentes and TNF alpha are elevated, which might be used as biomarkers to detect harness IC. Based on the recent researches of ICVPS, we might develop a diagnosis and treatment algorithm to set up different suitable treatment for specific subtype of ICVPS. In a long-term follow-up of ICVPS patients, we found about 50% of patients with ICVPS had symptom improvement after a mean of 16.6 uh, .6 years of follow-up. 76.3% of patients had regular follow-up. Among them, 12% are free of symptoms. 47% had symptom improvement of more than 50%. So in conclusion, the prevalence of IC in Asian countries and harness IC varied widely because of different diagnosis criteria. Harness IC and non harness IC or bladder pain syndrome should be separately diagnosed and treated. Further classification of non harness IC might be necessary due to different pathophysiology and treatment strategy. Thank you for your attention. Okay, okay, Darren. Now, uh, Rob, you can uh, present your uh, your lecture. Thanks for, so much for having me uh, speak with you uh, today. Um, I just uh, my uh, my uh, my task today is basically to go over the North American perspective regarding epidemiology of ICBPS. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't, I think what I will be presenting to you today is pretty much very similar to prior uh, presenters. Um, I think you can see a sort of a common theme here uh, that we need to have uh, to better define the condition uh, because uh, how we define the condition is going to have a, a very significant impact on uh, the epidemiology. So if I can, let's see if, there we go. These are my disclosures. So I think some of these topics were discussed already, but uh, just to say that uh, difficulties with the epidemiology regarding this condition are not uh, are not uh, it, they're not exclusive to one portion of the globe. Uh, this is something that we all have been having difficulties with. 
If we review the epidemiology, you see that most studies are uh, retrospective. They're often not population-based, as you can read here. They're not cohort, uh, they're non-cohort studies. They don't follow patients out over time. And I think, the, again, getting back to the common themes here, uh, the biggest difficulties I think we've been having really relate to selection bias, most of which is really uh, centered upon the definition because how we define it uh, and diagnose it is uh, really has a direct impact on the epidemiology. Also, uh, that we do have problems with data acquisition. And what do I mean by that? There are so many names out there for this condition, whether it be painful bladder syndrome, bladder pain, uh, uh, painful bladder syndrome, bladder pain syndrome, interstitial cystitis. Uh, uh, and so forth, uh, when we're doing literature searches or when we're doing, we're trying to uh, find codes, for example, in our own databases or in uh, nationwide databases, uh, we may be coming up with different, uh, with different items, hence we get different uh, data uh, to uh, put into uh, our studies. So again, something to keep in mind. Uh, epidemiology, uh, as has probably previously been uh, mentioned really, uh, regarding ICBPS uh, goes back to the 1970s. And the last uh, studies that were done really sort of fizzled out um, around 2013, 2014. Um, I think probably one of the reasons it's fizzled out are just some of the dilemmas that we've had in, in pulling out the, the, the uh, proper numbers of patients. But you can see here, um, if you look at all the studies uh, collectively, you see a real disparity, if you look in the right-hand column, uh, in terms of the uh, prevalence per 100,000. So you see, for example, Japan, very low numbers, where in the U.S. Uh, and Finland, uh, you see very high numbers. Finland was probably also uh, high because of one of the issues. How do you define it? And this uh, particular study uh, was questionnaire-based. So again, how we define it, comes down to the epidemiology. So let's go back to the basics, I think, uh, when we talk about definitions. And this is something that's uh, been discussed, but I'll, I'll sort of give my spin on it here. Uh, we, where we started out in this field uh, was in the early um, 1900s, where Guy, um, Guy Hunter um, defined, or at least his name came to be um, uh, associated with the classical form of interstitial cystitis, and hence we had Hunter, Hunter ulcers initially, and now we turn them Hunter lesions. And these, of course, were areas of the bladder wall where we saw uh, focal uh, regions of inflammation. We know that the, usually there's a central area of uh, granulation tissue. Oftentimes, these um, this inflammation extends through the bladder wall all the way into the perivesical uh, surrounding fat. Um, we, if that was the only way to uh, make a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, which was based upon cystoscopic evaluation, we were probably missing a lot of patients who had the identical symptoms, the pain and the urinary frequency associated with the pain that went along with having these lesions. But finally, around the 1980s, uh, we realized that, well, there are these patients who have the exact same symptoms, but they don't have that classic uh, ulcer, or again, now as we term Hunter lesion. Uh, we needed to study these patients more carefully, uh, and there, thereby uh, there was some interest developed uh, through the National Institutes of Health in the United States, and blossomed from that were the NIDDK uh, criteria, branch of the NIH, where many of you know are rather um, uh, restrictive criteria. You needed, as, as Dr. Cervini talked about earlier on, uh, we needed to do uh, urodynamic evaluation. We needed to do uh, hydrodistension in the OR to look for typical uh, findings. So you can imagine, again, a restrictive uh, definition. Uh, there are many inclusion and many exclusion criteria. Well, then we realized a few years after that, that especially when we found that clinicians were using these research criteria to make clinical diagnoses out in the trenches, we realized that a lot of patients who have typical symptoms uh, were left untreated. And the, the, the number that uh, Phil Hanno in, a, in sort of one of the landmark papers in this area uh, came up with was about 60% miss rate. So that's not good. 
And therefore, we expanded the diagnosis, of course, uh, and uh, the definition of IC, now ICBPS, or uh, some groups called painful bladder syndrome IC, or now what the IASP, the International Association for the Study of Pain, calls cr chronic primary bladder pain syndrome. We expanded the definition even further, and you can imagine how that would shift the epidemiology higher and higher uh, prevalences we would see if we examined these individual populations. In the process, of course, we're losing uh, a lot of those patients who are clearly bladder-centric, and we have come up with, at least in clinical practice, a very heterogeneous population. And as again has been mentioned, our whole, um, one of our primary uh, goals uh, in the future is to better phenotype uh, those patients to hopefully obtain uh, better treatment uh, algorithms uh, for each individual group. Now, when I say uh, phenotypes, uh, one clear-cut phenotype that stands out are those original those patients who were originally described with those Hunter lesions, the classical form of true interstitial cystitis. And many groups, including Essex, uh, feel that this uh, probably should be broken out as a separate disease. It merits further attention. Um, it's a, a much easier group, certainly, to study because it's a much more homogeneous and, again, bladder-centric group. And, of course, we would put this in the categorization of rare diseases. Just to give you an idea of bladder centricity versus non, uh, the multidisciplinary approaches to the study of chronic urological pelvic pain, or MAP, uh, the MAP network in the United States, of an NIH-funded project, uh, looked at not just IC patients, ICBPS patients, but also those patients with male chronic pelvic pain syndrome, the, our prostatitis syndrome patients, and found that, in fact, only about a quarter of the patients truly had um, um, pelvic-based pain. Many, most of the patients, three quarters of the patients had not only the pelvic pain, but they had many areas of pain that they described well beyond the pelvis, suggesting that many of our patients have global, uh, global um, uh, disease, perhaps centralized pain, et cetera. To give you an idea, again, how, at least in the United States, uh, the, uh, uh, the, this broad definition has been incorporated into guidelines. I'm just showing you the uh, 2022 uh, update of the uh, ICVPS guidelines. I'm just going to highlight, I'm not going to go through the algorithm, but I will highlight what the definition uh, according to the guidelines is, which includes, and look at this, how broad can it be? an unpleasant sensation, pain, pressure, or discomfort perceived uh, to be related to the urinary bladder and, of course, associated with lower urinary tract and, uh, symptoms. Not, th not three months, not six months, but, of course, six weeks duration. So when we hone it down here, when we talk about a condition that might be present for only six weeks. We talk about more broad-based types of noxious sensations, not pain, but now we're talking about discomfort or pressure. We're expanding the diagnosis, and you can imagine with these little tweaks uh, in the di in um, in a definition, how how much uh, of a profound effect that might have in terms of uh, the numbers of patients that would be included uh, as having IC symptoms. This uh, is uh, one of, uh, another uh, relatively recent publication through the International Association for the Study of Pain, where they uh, basically don't like the, con the whole uh, uh, terminology of IC or bladder pain syndrome. They would like to call it chronic primary bladder pain syndrome. I'm not going to get into the whole taxonomy issues, but if we look at their uh, um, diagnostic criteria or their definition, they're talking about uh, uh, what we call now ICVPS as a form of chronic pelvic pain, again, perceived to be in the region of the urinary bladder, associated, in this case, a little more honed down, such, uh, such as worsening of the pain upon bladder filling, not just perceived to be in the bladder, but worsening of pain about bladder filling, a little more specific uh, associated with irritative voiding symptoms. And again, of course, exclusion of, uh, for other uh, conditions that might overlap uh, and confound the diagnosis. Probably, and this is a study that was uh, discussed earlier, but I'm just going to, uh, again, I, I can't, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, a very illustrative study of how 
uh, definitions can uh, have a very important impact on the numbers of patients we uh, we perceive to have the uh, these difficulties. Uh, this is what's been termed the uh, RICE study, the RAND Corporation uh, study for interstitial cystitis epidemiology, uh, where almost uh, uh, 100,000 U.S. households were queried, specifically the women in the households, um, about um, discomfort. As you can see here, symptoms that might be related to ICVPS. And you can see here, they have a high sensitivity and a high specificity definition. Both of these include pain, pressure, again, discomfort, not in the bladder, pelvic area, and daytime uh, urinary frequency and urgency perceived to be secondary to that pain or discomfort. If we extrapolate the numbers here, uh, looking at the high specificity and high sensitivity, using those broad-based uh, definitions, you can see how the numbers start to uh, uh, increase multiple fold, anywhere from uh, now an estimated three to almost eight million uh, U.S. females in the United States, not with a diagnosis of IC, but symptoms that might reflect uh, uh, some type of IC-related picture. All right, so now we have the whole broad definition. Let's go back to the honed down definition of the classic form of interstitial cystitis. Again, that first, uh, the first descriptions. Uh, and those patients do exist. Uh, they are relatively uncommon. And if we look at prevalence studies, even in the overall um, uh, uh, population of patients who have ICVPS, they still represent probably, we think, less than 10% of the population. They tend to be uh, older patients, uh, but the, the most important uh, clinical dilemma is that there's really no way to sort these patients out beyond performing a cystoscopic examination. We do not have biomarkers. Uh, we don't have any real clinical uh, way to differentiate them beyond our cystoscopes uh, from the uh, uh, patients with ICVPS who don't have those uh, those specific lesions. So much more work needs to be done in the field. So as my last slide for you uh, today uh, in, uh, shows, we do have more work to do. Uh, and I think as most of the uh, discussions today have, uh, uh, I think we agree on that um, as we broaden uh, the definition, Clearly, the prevalence of ICVPS will increase, but I do agree with my, my uh, 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 fellow lecturers uh, today that the bladder-centric patients still remain probably uncommon, at least within the larger group, uh, perhaps representing about 25% of the overall population. Uh, we know that uh, the Hunter lesion patients are uncommon, but of course, uh, they are probably the most homogeneous uh, group, and probably as far as phenotype is concerned, that probably the, if, we, if, we, um, if we concentrate um, uh, research efforts on this group, we know we're dealing with a fairly stable uh, population. Uh, so at least one uh, avenue of uh, uh, further research probably will be, uh, I would hope, uh, would be vested in this, this patient population. Uh, but even getting away from uh, the epidemiology now, it's my last bullet point, we really have not made a lot of therapeutic progress. I think as uh, uh, my, uh, the other lecturers had mentioned, uh, we do need to phenotype better. I think that's a very important issue. And we do, uh, with hopefully better phenotyping, need to make some progress uh, as far as therape therapies are concerned, because at this point, of course, we only have two FDA-approved medications uh, on the books, at least in the United States, uh, DMSO and uh, pentacen polysulfate. Uh, neither of them are, as we call, home runs. Uh, we really need to uh, uh, increase our armamentarium to take the best uh, care possible for this um, this um, real unfortunate group of patients uh, that need our help. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for uh, for uh, your presentation. Uh, we have uh, uh, seven minutes uh, just to make uh, a discussion. Uh, you can uh, you can see. Uh, that uh, the, the huge discrepancy among uh, different countries uh, from uh, Europe uh, to Asia, to Korea, to Japan, and to US. Million of patients, but uh, 
uh, honestly, Re Rob Maldwin said uh, symptoms of uh, BPSIC, symptoms. That is a different one compared to the uh, specific definition. Uh, this is a, there is a one question from uh, from a participant. Uh, the question is: uh, female pelvic floor and its anatomy may confuse the differential diagnosis. Is still a, an incidental finding? Uh, from my side, I can say that uh, not specifically because there are uh, some uh, uh, some problem of uh, pelvic floor that can uh, mimic the 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 BPSIC, but uh, uh, obviously there are uh, uh, some specific uh, 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 evaluation. Uh, first of all, the physical exam, the physical exam that can uh, can evaluate uh, the tenderness of the of the of the pelvic floor with the trigger point with the, the tender of the anterior vaginal wall and uh, and the urethra and uh, and the um, uh, bladder area. This is a uh, one one uh, one possible explanation, uh, but uh, obviously there are some uh, some uh, confusion uh, and confusable disease associated. Uh, I don't know if you want to make uh, another comment, uh, Rob, about oh, this sure. question. Uh, <laughs> well, I I, I ha would have to say when I started uh, having an interest in interstitial cystitis and, and treating patients and diagnosing, uh, I, I I always tell people at first I didn't even think that you know ICVPS existed. I thought everybody had pelvic floor problems. Everyone seemed to have uh, urgency, frequency, and pelvic pain. Um, but much of it was uh, when we. Uh, identified uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, myalgia, high tone pelvic floor dysfunction, which I think this this uh, yeah, the question relates to, um, and we treated with physical therapy, muscle relaxants, and so forth. Uh, people got better. Uh, then all of a sudden, the the real IC patients came through the door, and then we then we realized that probably about 80, and this is borne out in the literature, of course, that probably about 80 percent of patients who truly even have bladder centric pain, they will have pelvic floor uh, discomfort as well. I think as for, uh, for us as clinicians, uh, this is a big dilemma uh, because uh, we do need to sort uh, these two possible two pain generators uh, from one another. And I think as we move forward with, uh, you know, uh, with new therapy, uh, with new protocol, research protocols, new medications out, we are going to have to sort this out because if someone has, let's say, half of their pain coming from pelvic floor issues and half of their pain uh, related to the bladder, if you're, let's say, putting a, an installation in the bladder, the best you're going to do is rid the patient of 50% of their pain. So these are uh, issues that are, are um, we need to it's a great question, and I think these are issues that we really need to be addressing. It is definitely one uh, specific phenotype uh, that we have, uh, it, and it needs to be addressed. Great question. Okay, uh, second question is, uh, what is the evidence for a genetic origin of primary bladder pain syndrome? Uh, there are some, uh, uh, some, uh, um, a preliminary experience on uh, genetic origin there are some uh, some study from uh, from asia from china uh, china center in in which there is uh, a, a possible genetic linking with the uh, origin of uh, of uh, bps and uh, and the, this is uh, obviously is uh, only a preliminary research that should be evaluated uh, uh, um, in going on uh, another question is uh, what I perceive is there is is a little research uh, on uh, live materials. Could you make uh, a, 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 we, what I perceive is there is a little research research on live materials, Rob? Live materials that means uh, on biopsy, biopsy, on a uh, uh, biobank, biobank. Oh, biobank. Um, I think we do. I mean, if that. If I'm understanding the question correctly, and I'm not sure I do, um, I mean, we do need to have, um, I think the, the way to move forward, and this is just an opinion, of course, um, is to develop, just like uh, many of our colleagues uh, in oncology do, 
uh, to develop tissue banks, uh, urine banks, uh, for um, to study patients, uh, to categorize them better, to develop. Um, um, you know, we, we want to have more research in uh, biomarkers moving forward. Um, but yeah, we do need um, the uh, the material to look at uh, and to evaluate. Uh, one benefit of uh, of the old NIDDK criteria, and of course, as you Moro had previously mentioned in Europe, a very common um, uh, algorithm of care is to include uh, cystoscopy under anesthesia with uh, with a biopsy as well. Um, so we in the United States are not doing that as uh, frequently. Uh, we'll do it if there's a lesion. I always will biopsy a hunter lesion uh, to assure that there's no carcinoma in situ present. But but in general, it's not done uh, uh, with the frequency that we did it. You know, when I started out in the field 30 years ago, certainly. Another question just for you as American, as American uh, doctor. <laughs> uh, uh, is cystoscopy, is cystoscopy always performed in US? And if not always, why? Why? The question is why is not uh, is not routinely performed? I know the I know the 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 <laughs> how to, to answer, but I would like to you 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 do that. The, the, Beat up the American today, right? <laughs> um, I would. Uh, I, um, I if you actually if you look at the new uh, guidelines from the American Urological Association, um, I, I think that there's definitely been a shift. So in the updated guidelines, um, uh, what it's what's recommended uh, is cystoscopy at an earlier time. Uh, they they do you know in the guidelines if someone has typical symptoms. Um, and they have a negative urinalysis, many, just like many of our patients, for example, who have overactive bladder. You don't, if they have a negative urinalysis, they have a negative, if they, even if they're, you know, a smoker, they have a negative cytology and so forth, you low suspicion patient, um, you can treat. Um, if they don't do well, then you might want to go back to cystoscopic examination. The newest guidelines uh, actually say if the patient's a little older, um, you might all and have and you're suspicious, for example, that a hunter lesion might exist. Then it's perfectly acceptable to say, listen, let's go and do a, a cystoscopic exam at a much earlier uh, point in time. So I think uh, we've liberalized the um, we've definitely liberalized the cystoscopic exam. Certainly the office cystoscopic exam. Um, I now I have a different. I mean, my own opinion on this is that I typically uh, will um, cystoscope most patients relatively early on because number one, I don't want to miss an inflammatory lesion. The other thing that I think I get out of a cystoscopic examination is uh, is simply the the you know I don't believe in using a cystoscope just as a way to look inside and look for inflammation. You can use a cystoscopic examination to get a sense of a reproduction of the pain with bladder filling. Uh, you can get an idea of the degree of urethral sensitivity. Uh, you can even sometimes we touch the back wall of the bladder and see often if there's a hyperemic effect. So I think there's still um, information you can get out of the cystos uh, uh, out of an office cystoscopy. The other thing I think that is very handy to, to know about is possibly the installation of an anesthetic during an office exam. Uh, because if you believe that the patient's pain is coming from the bladder and we put, let's say, a combination of bupivacaine or, and lidocaine or just lidocaine, what have you, in the bladder, and the patient actually feels better after that, then um, we know we have perhaps a, a bladder-centric patient and perhaps that my patient might be, again, all theory here, might be more amenable to, um, to uh, intravesical agents. Uh, another interesting question is about the uh, ERN uh, urogene. Uh, uh, if they take in, into consideration an epidemiologic study based on the 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 SE criteria in Europe or in a specific random country, this is an excellent question. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are um, um, thinking uh, to to. To start with uh, with uh, this uh, this uh, kind of a project, but uh, as you know, the epidemiologic study they they need a lot of money, a lot of uh, of, of time to to assess uh, any 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 specific conclusion. 
and uh, but uh, just uh, i think uh, after this uh, this webinar probably uh, we can uh, we can have a more uh, direct contact with the with the with the work stream uh, uh, network just to evaluating the possibility the, the main problem as always is the is the, the sponsor that think that they they can uh, can support uh, this uh, important important project because uh, you um, you uh, as uh, uh, as we can uh, clearly uh, um, uh, show uh, that uh, uh, the, the the problem of uh, of uh, um, epidemiology is a, a really one of the controversial uh, aspect of uh, of a BPSIC and uh, and uh, i uh, we need uh, we need uh, uh, tremendously uh, the the possibility to to or to assess uh, the real impact of uh, this uh, syndrome on the population because uh, uh, after this all the the, the 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 treatment all the the management of those complex patient is more easy for uh, for us as a, as a doctor as an expert as a center that they are approach those uh, those those patients uh i i i can uh, can say more about uh, the this uh, this uh, this uh, statement and uh, i would like to thank all the participants and uh, to thank deeply all the speakers they they did a great job a great uh, uh, presentations and uh, we will follow uh, the other seminar uh, and uh, webinar uh, just uh, uh, every one or two months uh, just dealing with the, the different uh, aspect of uh, of uh, of the bps and i would like that rob that is uh, the president of the next uh, annual uh, meeting of the ESIC will present shortly in a few words if possible uh, the meeting that is uh, is coming in uh, next month please uh, rob oh you want me to speak about that I, um, no no okay. just uh, just uh, just uh, uh, just the, the announcement that they can see uh, through the website oh okay um sure i mean the, so we have a um a, a basically a three day um uh program uh which really uh are bringing together a worldwide collection of really luminaries uh, in the field of pelvic pain uh, and uh, ICBPS. Um, we're all meeting in um, Greenwich Village, uh, New York, in uh, New York City, uh, and we're very excited to uh, be able to uh, hopefully develop new collaborations within ESSEC um, to, uh, that, that's really uh, to develop friendships, to develop uh, ways to uh, uh, have uh, enhance uh, our, um, our uh, therapies uh, to teach each other actually uh, about some of our specific areas of interest. Um, it's going to be, I think, a wonderful uh, collaborative experience for everybody. Um, we are trying to get this on the web. <laughs> uh, so to share uh, some of these really brilliant people uh, coming together and their thoughts and ideas of uh, where we are now and where we're going in the future. Uh, we're very excited about it, and um, we're hoping that we can um, um, uh, share it with you uh, in, in future meetings. Okay, thank you, thank you, everybody, and uh, we will uh, we'll have the the next uh, webinar on uh, BPSIC next month. We we you will see on the web uh, the uh, the schedule for for the webinar, and uh, hope uh, I hope that uh, this. Uh, uh, this webinar represents one of the, the the beginning to to uh, to approach uh, this complex problem that uh, uh, afflicts a lot of, uh, of women and that is a part of our uh, main work. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, so quickly, just before every goes, thank you all the presenters and thank you, Mario, for all, uh, helping bring all this together. Thank you to those who attended. Just quickly. 
there'll be a survey the attendees will get straight after this if you can fill that in we'd be much appreciative of that um yes please check the eurogen website for the future sessions in this uh series and our other sessions as well and also the session's been recorded so if anybody missed any part of it um it will be um a kind of tidied up version shall we say um will be um on the um go to webinar channel and our youtube channel tomorrow i'll send out direct links to all attendees and registrants for that um please register to our youtube channel as well we've got lots of other um all our past webinars are on there as well so again uh, sorry for that spiel um uh, thank you for to everyone thank you to robert and to Maro and to the other presenters and the attendees as well thank you have a good evening everyone and take care and bye. see you all soon bye 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 bye